I'm Chris Wallace. Another deadly attack in London. Britain's Prime Minister condemns an evil ideology. We'll get the latest in live reports from London and we'll discuss what it means for the U.S. with Roy Blunt, a member of the Senate Intelligence Committee. Then, President Trump pulls the U.S. out of the Paris Climate Accord and starts a global debate. I was elected to represent the citizens of Pittsburgh, not Paris. We'll discuss the impact on the environment, the U.S. economy, and America's place in the world with Scott Pruitt, head of the Environmental Protection Agency. And critics attack President Trump for leaving the climate deal, pointing to long-lasting consequences. Make our planet great again. How is he ever going to explain to his grandchildren what he did to the air they breathe? We'll talk with one of the world's leading advocates on climate change, former Vice President Al Gore, who calls the president's withdrawal reckless and indefensible. Pruitt and Gore, live only on Fox News Sunday. Plus, former FBI Director James Comey testifies before Congress this week about his conversations with Mr. Trump. We'll ask our Sunday panel about what promises to be a moment of high drama. All right now on Fox News Sunday. And hello again from Fox News in Washington. We begin with breaking news out of London. At least seven are dead and dozens injured after another terror attack targeted Britain's capital. This comes less than two weeks after a suicide bomber hit a pop concert in Manchester, England. In a few minutes, we'll talk with Senator Roy Blunt, a member of the Senate Intelligence Committee. But we begin with Fox team coverage, Catherine Herridge on what the intelligence community is saying. But first, senior foreign affairs correspondent Greg, Greg Palcott live from our London bureau. Greg. Chris, for the third time in three months, terror hits the UK. And once again, it is ugly. It was on a busy Saturday night in London that the attackers spread across London Bridge in a rented van, driving up on the walkway, smashing into pedestrians. They then ditched that vehicle a few blocks away and armed with long knives, stabbed their way through bars and restaurants nearby, with some putting up a fight. All told, at least seven people were killed, 48 injured, many critically, including an off-duty police officer along with British citizens from France, Australia, and elsewhere were targeted. No word yet on whether um, any Americans were involved. Now, police caught up with the attackers just eight minutes later, shooting dead all three. At least one had a beard, camouflage pants, and a fake suicide vest. When one attacked, he reportedly screamed out, praise to Allah, the Arabic word for God. Here is what UK Prime Minister Theresa May had to say today. As a country, our response must be as it has always been when we have been confronted by violence. We must come together. We must pull together. And united, we will take on and defeat our enemies. Police now say they have arrested 12 people following raids in eastern London, said to be the home of one of the attackers. It is a sign that authorities might be on the trail of jihadis. Police also doing a thorough forensic search of the entire terror site. But what is next? Prime Minister Theresa May also said today, terror breeds terror. Chris. Greg Palcott reporting from London. Greg, thanks for that. Now let's bring in Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine Herridge with the latest on who was behind the attack. Catherine. Chris, no group is claiming responsibility this morning, but within minutes of the attack, a senior ISIS affiliated social media account pushed out slick propaganda on using vehicles as weapons, threatening more violence. It's not clear whether the ISIS posts were opportunistic or the terror group played a role. This morning, U.S. and U.K. intelligence are focused on the suspects and whether they acted alone or had a terror network behind them. British security sources reporting that very early indications suggest the attack may have been pulled together at short notice. With the rising homegrown threat, British police are trained to quickly neutralize suspects as they did last night.
That vehicle continued to drive from London Bridge to Borough Market. The suspects then left the vehicle and a number of people were stabbed. The suspects were shot dead by armed officers. Homeland Security is saying that at this time they have no information to indicate a specific credible threat to the United States. But Secretary Kelly told Fox last night he worries we are, quote, right around the corner from having a similar attack, but for the efforts of DHS and law enforcement agencies. President Trump was briefed last night and spoke with the British Prime Minister, expressing his condolences and praising the heroic response of London police and first responders. The president also seeming to make a political point that the attack bolstered his travel ban. We need to be smart, vigilant, and tough, he tweeted. We need the courts to give us back our rights. We need the travel ban as an extra level of security, safety. Questions are being raised this morning about a possible intelligence failure after the British government recently lowered the threat level, Chris. Catherine, thank you. You're welcome. Joining me now, Roy Blunt, a member of the Senate Intelligence Committee. Senator, welcome back. Good to be with you. What can you add to what we just heard from Catherine Herridge? Well, you know, I think what we're seeing here is just such a broad band of, of potential attacks. You know, we hear from our own intelligence community and have for years now more threats from more directions than ever before you see the terrible Manchester bombing those young people mostly mostly young young women young girls uh, with a fairly sophisticated uh, bomb uh, based on published reports on that uh, these guys have a van and kitchen knives uh, we think other groups are looking at more advanced kinds of attacks and so clearly this is from all directions Isis uh, tends to take credit for the things that you can uh, steal a truck get your van drive in a car terrorize people with very little uh, planning or backup uh, other groups we believe are looking at other things and uh, uh, we are constantly have to be vigilant. And uh, I think uh, Sec uh, Secretary Kelly is right uh, when he says that uh, only because we have been fortunate and worked hard to prevent this have we not had these kind of attacks here. I want to play a clip from British Prime Minister May today. Here it is. While the recent attacks are not connected by common networks, they are connected in one important sense. They are bound together by the single evil ideology of Islamist extremism. Any explanation as to why we have now seen three fatal terror attacks in Britain in less than three months? I don't know if there's any real explanation for that, but in, in Paris, in London, in, in Western Europe generally, you've got uh, people who came there to do jobs that were allowed to stay in enclaves, never became part of the society. You see the second generation of those families often turning uh, to uh, what uh, what the Prime Minister mentioned. You know, we need to say it. We need to talk about it. Uh, our friends who are Muslim need to admit that this extreme uh, sense of Islam that uh, results in these attacks has to be called for what it is uh, and we have to try to do what we can to intervene. Do we have, I've heard the argument that because we're beginning to roll back ISIS in the so-called caliphate in Iraq, in Syria, that there's an increased emphasis on attacks, these kind of low technology attacks in the West. Do you think our success in one place is creating more of a threat? I think it can. You know, somebody made the observation not long ago that a lot, sometimes a country's implode, Syria seems to have exploded, that uh, as, as things change in Syria, people have access to Europe in ways that, that you would otherwise want to try to do something about. There's no way to do background checks on people that come in from communities that no longer exist, jobs that were jobs months or years ago. Uh, and so we, we, I think we do see that. And, uh, you know, like so many of the things that have happened in Northern Africa, what people initially thought would be the result turned out to be just the opposite. As a member of the Senate Intelligence Committee, any indication of an increased terror threat here in the U.S.? I think the, the terror threat is real. Um, 
you know, one of the things when we've seen things like San Bernardino, more often than not, the U.S. officials, the FBI and others talk to these people uh, at, after months of surveillance, decided that they no longer needed to be under the level of watch they were. And then suddenly these kinds of things happen. Uh, I, I do think, again, that you've got some groups that are looking at a big play like taking down an air an airliner you've got others who need very little support very little planning and can do incredible damage which is actually in many ways almost more of a of terrorism because you go anywhere do anything you wonder what could happen at any You're moment it could on happen London here. bridge on a saturday night london bridge the the uh, the westminster bridge the uh, the a concert, concert yeah. uh, all of these things are true terror targets they're that not it's not like going after after the U.S. Embassy. Right. They are true terror targets. As Catherine mentioned, just after the news broke about this terror attack, President Trump tweeted uh, a, another call for his travel ban. That case is now before the U.S. Supreme Court. Do you think the justices should pay attention to the kind of thing that is happening in England uh, and other parts of the world as they make that decision. I mean, the fact is, in Britain, most of these terrorists have been homegrown. They've been UK citizens. They have been, and you know, looking at where people like that who who are coming to our country have been. Uh, is important. I'm not nearly as concerned as a lot of people are about the visa waiver program because the visa waiver program just triggers that you can spend more time on people who you have reason to believe may have been in Libya, may have been in Syria, may have become uh, radicalized. I, I don't know what the court will decide. I'm not a lawyer. I think my view is the president does have certainly the right to put in place extreme vetting. Uh, and uh, you know, Chris, it's been four, it's been, uh, four months since they sent they needed four months to put, put that in place. I think you can do that without a travel ban, and hopefully we are. I want to talk to you about another hat as a member of the Senate Intelligence Committee. A lot of anticipation about the testimony this week from FBI, former FBI Director James Comey. What do you expect to hear from him? What questions do you have for him? Well, I think it's important that we talk to everybody that should be talked to about this. I do believe that the Senate Intelligence Committee is the most likely place uh, to bring this investigation to conclusion with whatever the conclusion turns out to be. You know, used to dealing with each other on issues like this, so we're used to classified documents, we're used to coming together to protect the country. Hopefully that's what we'll be able to do What with are you looking this. for from Comey? Uh, yeah, we, uh, what Comey says and how he says it, I think will be important. I haven't frankly understood much of what Comey has done since uh, about a year ago. Uh, and his, his decisions have been, I think, highly questionable. We'll see what, uh, why he was prepared for that meeting the way he was. Said he had a round of murder board kind of questions before he went to see the president, why he thought it was important to immediately download that, and what other meetings he had that, uh, frankly, he didn't think were so important to down, uh, download what happened. Uh, finally, do you think that President Trump has a legitimate claim to executive privilege to block Comey from testifying, and as a practical matter, do you think he should invoke it? I think the president is better served by getting all this information out sooner rather than later. Let's find out what happened and bring this to a conclusion. Um, you don't do that, I think, by invoking executive privilege on a, a com on a conversation you had apparently with nobody else in the room. You know, most stories have two sides to them. At some point, uh, uh, we'll hear the president's side, but I frankly think we need to hear Mr. Comey's side and uh, find out what other questions we need to ask after he answers the questions this week. Senator Blunt, thank you. Thanks for your time this Sunday, and thank you for coming in on short notice. Glad to be here. Up next, President Trump's dramatic decision this week to pull out of the Paris Climate Accord. We'll talk with EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt, a key player in the president's deliberations. This bell rings, it starts a chain reaction that's... A look outside the Beltway at Pittsburgh. The president said he's looking out for residents of the former steel town in pulling out of the Paris climate deal. 
International leaders, business executives, and people around the world are still reacting to President Trump's decision this week. In a few minutes, we'll talk with former Vice President Al Gore, a leading advocate on climate change. But joining me now is Scott Pruitt, Mr. Trump's administrator for the Environmental Protection Agency and a key player in the president's decision. Mr. Pruitt, welcome back to Fox News Sunday. Good morning, Chris. I want to start with a question that you were asked repeatedly on Friday. Here it is. Yes or no, does the president believe that climate change is real and a threat to the United States? Does the president believe uh, today that climate change is a hoax? What's interesting about all the discussions we had through the last several weeks have been focused on one singular issue. Is Paris good or not for this country? Let me get this straight. You and the president spent weeks discussing whether he should pull out of the Paris climate deal and you never discussed climate change? It was about the merits and demerits of the deal, Chris. But so part that's of that is climate the focus. Change. That's the focus. Look, when you look at what this country has achieved since, since the late 1990s, 2000 time frame, we've seen an 18% reduction in our CO2 footprint from 2000 to 2014. We're at pre-1994 levels. You know, what's interesting about all this criticism from the left, the environmental left, is if you go back to the time that the Paris deal was cut, uh, those same groups, in fact, James Hansen, former national sci scientist, uh, called it a fake and a fraud. The general counsel of the Sierra Club was critical of what was achieved in Paris because it didn't hold China, it did not hold India accountable, and the United States agreed to 26 to 28 percent reductions. We're going to get in its GHG, but, th but sir, that's going to focus. Get, sir, we're going to get into focus. all of that. But what I'm asking you is, as the president's EPA administrator, as his point person on the environment. Isn't that a conversation that over the last few months you have to have whether or not climate change is real or a hoax, as the president suggested, and whether or not human activity contributes to it? Are what, you saying you've never had that conversation with him? The, the focus of the last several weeks I'm was asking centered, you, over was the last centered, few months was centered on the merits and demerits of the Paris Agreement. Have you ever the had a conversation the president, the president on climate said, change? The president has said, said actually back during the campaign, that, that climate change occurs. I've said, I said during my confirmation process, that climate change is occurring, uh, that human activity contributes to it. He's also uh, said it was a hoax. Well, Chris, the, the point here, and to your question, uh, this is something over the last several weeks, the president has received much information about the impact on jobs, and also the impact on the environment. You know, we have nothing to be apologetic about as a country with respect to what we've done in reducing our CO2 footprint. That's I don't want to be a dead here, but you're not going to tell me whether or not the president believes climate change is a hoax and whether or not human activity. It's a simple question. The president has indicated the climate changes. It's always changing. I've indicated the same. Well, that's just what's, 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 what's important, Chris, here? What's important is what the president did on Thursday was put America first and say to the United States and say to the world that we're going to remain engaged, uh, but we're also going to make sure that as we remain engaged, we put America's interests first. As you pointed out, the president justified pulling out of the Paris deal largely on economic terms. Here he is. The American family will suffer the consequences in the form of lost jobs and a very diminished quality of life. But the study that the president cited was funded by two groups that are dramatically opposed to environmental regulation. And the study itself acknowledges it does. This is a quote from the study. It does not take into account potential benefits from avoided emissions. The study results are not a benefit cost analysis of climate change. Well, there were several the administrator. The, it is a worst case scenario. There's there's several studies that were actually published in response to Paris. NERA, uh, the Heritage Study, the Global Policy he Publication. He quoted in, in NERA. My, there were several in, in, in that were sourced uh, aspects as far as his speech. And and what we know. From from uh, the Paris Agreement, objectively, is that it was a two and a half trillion dollar contraction to our economy over 10 years. What we do know is it impacted up to 400,000 jobs in this country. What we do know is it impacted both the manufacturing base and energy sector jobs. You know, since last the fourth quarter of 2016, Chris, we've had almost 50,000 jobs created in the mining and, and, and uh, coal sector alone. In fact, in the month of May, almost 7,000 jobs. So, so these individuals that are saying, and, and, and I think what's 
also being missed here is that, that when you look at our, how we generate electricity in this country, the power grid, we need fuel diversity. We need coal, natural gas, hydro, renewables, uh, nuclear as part of that mix because it provides stability and strength to our grid and lower costs. Our price per kilowatt compared to Germany, our price per kilowatt compared to Europe is far better and it helps us grow jobs in this country. But Mr. Pruitt, aren't you focusing on the wrong thing? I want to put up some I must say, surprising statistics. Take a look at this. The U.S. now employs more than double the number of people in the solar industry that it does in coal. Aren't you and the president talking about protecting the horse and buggy business just as cars come online? So, absolutely not, because as I just indicated, we need coal, we need, hydro, we need solid hydrocarbons stored on site at utility companies across this country to address something, uh, a tax on our grid, a tax on infrastructure. If we have peak demand needs, you want a diversity of fuels that generate uh, electricity. It is, it but, is I mean, bad business, the president it is bad talking, business for the a president country talks to, about, to limit the The president amount. talks about protecting the people of Pittsburgh. The mayor of Pittsburgh said, we're not a steel town anymore. We're a green town. And in fact, he rejected what the president said. And the mayor of Pittsburgh, the city he specifically cited, said we're going to comply with the Paris Climate Accord. This president has said we truly need an all the above approach. We should not penalize sectors of our economy, Chris. Government regulation shouldn't be used to pick winners and losers. The past administration declared a war on coal. And there were several coal facilities across this country shut down because of their past efforts. That is not what government regulation should be about. Government regulation should be about making things regular, not picking winners and losers, and making sure we have fuel diversity in generating electricity in this country. And, and as I indicated, the jobs numbers show already, already, that this president's deregulatory agenda, his leadership in the energy space is making a difference for jobs across this country. I, I wanna, Almost 50,000 in I the coal sector. I want to another alone. issue, because the president also said that the Paris Climate Accord and pulling out of it isn't going to make all that much difference on the environment. Here he is. With total compliance from all nations, it is estimated it would only produce a two-tenths of one degree. Think of that. This much. But the people behind the MIT study, that study that he just cited, say that he took a number from 2014 before the targets for the Paris Accord were even reached. And the co-founder of the program said this about the White House. They found a number that made the point they want to make. It's kind of a debate trick. The people behind the study the president cited say, look, Paris isn't going to solve everything. It isn't going to solve global warming, but it makes an important contribution. What short memories these folks have. What short memories they have. James Hansen, former NASA, NASA scientist, the father of climate change, he's been called, called Paris a fake and a fraud because of the very things the president cited. Two tenths of one, there were other studies. The global policy publication came out criticizing. Are you going to the, speak the, to what the, the MIT it, look, it's, author it's said? Very, it's very fishy to me that, that the MIT updated their study or their, their uh, results after we started citing it. No one's questioned the methodology. Well, Nobody's in questioned fact, the you didn't cite their study after Paris. There, there, you, you cited their study before Paris in 2014. And, and what's interesting, Chris, is during the time before Paris, before Paris, this country had reduced their CO2 footprint by over 18% from 2000 to 2014. What does that demonstrate? It demonstrates that uh, American innovation, American technology is leading the way with respect to reducing the CO2 footprint, not government mandate. If China and India want to reduce their CO2 footprint, they should learn from us. Well, uh, and and I, India, India, by the way, in the Paris Agreement, talking about the merits of the deal, Chris, conditioned any steps that they would take on receiving two and a half trillion dollars of aid. Uh, China agreed to make no steps until the year 2030. Well, wait, wait. They're I'm, the largest let, polluters let in the me, world. Let me pick up on that because that, uh, you've taken me exactly where I wanted to go. Well, because the oh, well. president, well, yes, this is working <laughs> together. The president had one more big complaint about Paris and he said that it treats the U.S. unfairly. China will be allowed to build hundreds of additional coal plants. So we can't build the plants but they can, according to this agreement. India will be allowed to double its coal production by 2020. But here again, sir, the reality 
is different, is very different from what the president said. China has canceled plans for more than 100 coal plants and promises 20% of its energy consumption will be green by 2030. India has pledged 40% of its energy will be renewable by 2030 and is set to pass Japan this year as the world's third largest market for solar power. So it may not mandate it, in the Paris Agreement, but in fact, China and India are going green already. You know, what, what's interesting, that you, one of the key words that were, was up on the screen was plants. China was actually building over 360 new coal generation facilities and had 800 planned, Chris. So maybe they've drawn back on the number that are planned, but they're burning coal and they're going to continue to burn coal well, we're burning for the coal. foreseeable future. We've had a contraction with respect to our grid quite substantially. We used to be well above 40 percent. We're now down around 30 percent, if not less. So it, the, this country has front-loaded its cost. The rest of the world said, hey, we'll get to that later. Uh, they applauded when, the Ameri when we joined Paris. The rest of the world applauded, not because of climate reductions, but because it put this country at an economic disadvantage. We, the clean power plan alone, the clean power plan alone represented almost $300 bill, billion dollars of compliance cost to our economy. Uh, so, so why wouldn't Paris, excuse me, why wouldn't France and, and, and these other countries want us to stay in that kind of deal? It's a bad deal for this country. The president didn't say, by the way, that we're, we weren't going to continue engagement. The president didn't. He said Paris represents yeah, a bad deal for this country. He also said we're going to re renegotiate, and all of the leaders around the world, certainly in Europe, said forget it. Well, then, then he also said either a new deal or as part of the Paris Agreement. But we're already part, look, we're the United States, Chris. We don't lose our seat at the table. Uh, we joined a treaty in 1992 called the UNFCCC with respect to climate change. Right. And, and that is still there. We're going to remain engaged internationally, but we're going to make sure that as we make deals, that we put the interest of America first. This was applauded by small business. You know, it was interesting. The New York Times yesterday nope. had an article that of small business that I, applauded. I, I don't want you to filibuster so we can't get to Al Gore. We want to get to him okay, too. Okay. And you've brought up a lot of legitimate points I'm going to ask him about. Mr. Pruitt, thank you for your time. Always good to talk Thanks, with you Chris. and thank you for answering our questions. Thanks, Chris. That's what it's all about. Up next, former Vice President Al Gore on Mr. Trump's decision to pull out of the Paris Accord. Former Vice President Al Gore's breakthrough documentary, An Inconvenient Truth, brought the topic of climate change to the forefront. Not surprisingly, he is one of the sharpest critics of Mr. Trump's decision this week. We welcome him for what we believe is his first appearance on Fox News since the 2000 <laughs> campaign. Mr. Vice President, good to have you back. Great to be back, Chris. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, before we get to climate change, I want to ask you about this terrible attack in London. How do we stop these attacks on the West? And is President Trump's travel ban part of the answer? Well, most of the attacks, both in England and here in the United States, have been by homegrown uh, terrorists. And of course, the courts will deal with the travel ban. They've already been struck down. We'll see what the Supreme Court does. This scourge of terrorism, we, we have to defeat it, but we have to defeat it not only with force of arms, but with the force of our values. And I truly believe that giving uh, people around the world a sense that the world's got our act together and we're going to move forward to a bright future is one of the important tasks at hand. Let's turn to the subject at hand. You met with President-elect Trump during the transition to discuss climate change, and afterwards, you said this. I had a, a lengthy and very productive session with the President-elect. Uh, it was uh, a sincere search for areas of common ground. You also talked with Mr. Trump, we're told, last month about staying in the Paris climate deal. Did you misjudge the President? Well, I've kept my communications with him uh, confidential. I think that's the right way to handle it, but none of it would surprise you. I did my best to persuade him it was in our country's best interest to stay in the Paris Agreement. Uh, I, I thought there was a chance that he would do that. I'm sorry that he made the other decision. How do you explain it? Well, you'd have to ask him for the explanation. It makes no sense to me. I think that it was a reckless decision, an indefensible decision. I think it uh, undermines our nation's standing in the world and isolates us and threatens to harm humanity's ability to solve this crisis in time. But 
uh, make no mistake about it, the, this country is going to continue to solve the climate crisis. Uh, governors like Jerry Brown and Andrew Cuomo, Jay Inslee, many others, uh, mayors, Mike Bloomberg's doing a great job rallying uh, mayors around the country. Uh, we are going to continue reducing emissions. Atlanta just decided to go 100% renewable, and there are many, many others. Let's talk, and I you heard me challenge uh, Scott Pruitt. I'm going to challenge you. Let's talk about some of the concerns that people have about Paris. President Trump talked about one. It includes yet another scheme to redistribute wealth out of the United States through the so-called Green Climate Fund. Nice name. Under the Paris Accord, 37 developed countries agreed to provide $100 billion to developing countries. Why is that fair? Well, you, you know, when the Marshall Plan was launched by the United States after World War II, it ended up benefiting us tremendously as well as making the world a better place we would have been uh, we would be 11th on the list of nations per capita in in helping uh, the country to meet this climate challenge uh, and by the way w one of the opportunities for us is to export our products and create more jobs here you showed some jobs in the solar energy uh, industry uh, earlier solar jobs are now growing 17 times faster than other jobs. It's the brightest spot. If we get out there in the economy, if we get out there and help to lead this uh, sustainability revolution, it benefits our economy. But here's the th problem I think a lot of people have. Countries like the U.S., which have been developing an industrial economy since the 19th century, the argument is that somehow we owe something to countries that didn't. Well, it's a global challenge, and the world community as a whole has to has to face up to it. Uh, this administration has said there's no such thing as a, a global community. Uh, actually, there is, because we, as a civilization, are putting 110 million tons of heat-trapping global warming pollution up into the sky every day as if it's an open sewer. Uh, and, it, you know, the climate crisis is real, Chris. I, I'm, I'm sure you know that uh, President Trump won't say whether he believes it's real or not but but it is real and you don't have to rely on the virtually unanimous opinion of the scientific community any, anymore mother nature is telling us every night on the TV news now is like a nature hike through the book of Revelation people are noticing this these downpours and historic floods we've had 11 once in a thousand year downpours in the US just in the last 10 years uh, we've got these wild fires that become mega fires now we've got a 70 percent of florida's in drought today missouri declared a, a, a an emergency just a couple of days ago because of, no, of another one of these and they keep on coming but, but let me pick up on that because let's say that we agree and you know a lot of people don't some people don't some people that watch fox right, news don't course. Even if you believe in greenhouse gas and climate change, there's some questions about how effective the Paris Accord is yeah. in dealing with it. Here's what EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt said on Friday about the effectiveness of the U.S. target, which is to reduce uh, our car greenhouse gas emissions by a quarter under 2005 levels. Here he is. Paris. It set targets of 26 to 28 percent. With the entire agenda of the pre previous administration, we still fell 40 percent short of those targets. Uh, it was a failed deal to begin with. You would agree that even if all 195 nations, not 194, met their targets, it still wouldn't solve the problem. Uh, th that is correct. However, it sends a very powerful signal to business and industry and civil society uh, and countries around the world. And since the Paris Agreement w was reached, look at what has happened. Uh, you talked about China earlier. China has now reduced its emissions four years in a row. It's reduced its coal burning three years in a row. India is now in the midst of a massive shift from coal to solar. 
Unbelievably, India just announced two weeks ago that within 13 years, 100% of their automobiles are going to have to be electric vehicles. We're seeing this in this country as well. I went to one of the most conservative Republican cities in America, Georgetown, Texas, in an oil state. They have just completed the transition to 100% renewable but, but energy. That's part of the argument, Mr. Vice President, and it's a philosophical argument. Do you need government regulation or will the economy, will the market work and and we took the case of solar which is now double pretty astonishing yeah well actually we've got some stats here so we'll do it greenhouse gas emissions already declined 12 yeah. percent below 2005 levels between 2004 and 2015 investment in green clean energy rose from 10 billion dollars to 56 billion and as we point out now twice as many jobs in solar as in coal isn't the country isn't the world going green on its own does yes. it need this government this international regulation the the answer is yes and yes <laughs> we're in the midst of a sustainability revolution that has the magnitude of the industrial revolution but the speed of the digital revolution but yes we still need good policies because we have to move faster we're in a race uh, against time here we're seeing very encouraging changes but we have to change faster the late economist Rudy Dornbush I'm sure you knew him he once said Things take longer to happen than you think they will, and then they happen much faster than you thought they could. And the Paris Agreement was a successful effort to send the signal, this train is leaving the station, everybody on board. The U.S. should be on board. G states and cities and businesses and civil society leaders are on board. If we had the president on board and good policy, we could move even faster. I fact-checked Mr. Pruitt. I'm going to fact-check you. Okay. After your movie, An Inconvenient Truth, came out, in 2006, you made the following comments as part of your publicity for the, the movie. You said, unless we took, quote, drastic measures, the world would reach a point of no return within 10 years, and you called it a true planetary emergency. We're 11 years later. No. Weren't you wrong? Well, we have seen a, a decline in emissions for the first, on a global basis. For the first time, they've stabilized and started to decline. So some of the responses of the last 10 years have helped. But uh, unfortunately and regrettably, a lot of serious damage has been done. Greenland, for example, is losing one cubic kilometer of ice every single day. I went down to Miami and saw fish from the ocean swimming in the streets on a sunny day. The same thing was true in Honolulu lulu just two days ago just from high tides because of the sea level rise now we are going to suffer some of these consequences but we can limit and avoid the most catastrophic consequences if we accelerate the pace of change that's now beginning mr vice president we should point out you have a sequel coming up called an inconvenient sequel <laughs> uh, in july and i understand that you're going to have to rewrite the ending because of the decision the president was ma just made the the, the director Directors uh, Bonnie Cohen and John Schenk are putting a, a new segment at the very end of the movie, and I think that's appropriate. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Let's not wait another 17 years. Deal. Okay. Up next, we'll bring in our Sunday group to discuss a moment of high drama this week when former FBI Director James Comey testifies before the Senate Intelligence Committee. Plus, what would you like to ask the panel about what we can expect to learn from Comey? Just go to Facebook or Twitter at Fox News Sunday, and we may use your question on the air. Is the White House going to invoke executive privilege to prevent James Comey from testifying before the Senate Intelligence Panel next week? The date for that hearing was just set. I've not uh, spoken to counsel yet. I don't know what what that what they're going to how they're going to respond. White House Press Secretary Sean Spicer not answering whether the White House will try to block the former FBI director from talking to Congress on Thursday. And it's time now for our Sunday group, Fox News senior political analyst, Brett Hume, columnist for The Hill, Juan Williams, Julie Pace, who covers the White House for the Associated Press, and Jason Riley from the Wall Street Journal. Well, Julie, as we say, the White House refuses to say, but the New York Times is reporting over the weekend that the president is unlikely to invoke in executive privilege to block Comey from testifying, one, because it would be a PR disaster, and two, because his legal case is 
kind of week. Question, what are you hearing from your sources? Well, as recently as this morning, what I've heard is that the president is leaning toward not invoking executive privilege for Comey's testimony, but this is still an open decision. This is something that is going to be discussed in the coming days. And as we all know, with this president, it's not a final decision until it really comes. Why are they fooling around with us? I, well, I think there are a couple reasons. I think one, it actually is a discussion because they are worried about what Comey could potentially say, but they also recognize that if you do invoke executive privilege, just the optics of that makes it look like you're hiding something makes it look like whatever Comey might say is going to be problematic for the president. They think they have a little bit of a wiggle room here. I think if they don't invoke executive privilege and Comey does say something that is damaging to the president, what you're going to hear administration officials point out is that in previous testimony that Comey has, has done on Capitol Hill, the FBI has had to correct it. That there have been questions about things that he said. I think that's the argument that they're going to be starting to make. But again, leaning toward no, still an open discussion. We ask you for questions for the panel, and we got a bunch on just this issue. Uh, here's one we got on Twitter from Hate Dirty Politics. Why did he, Comey, wait so long to come out and say he was threatened by POTUS? Why after he was fired? And is this revenge? For being fired, uh, Jason, I have to say a lot of our viewers are asking, why didn't Comey either resign or blow the whistle as soon as he believed the president was somehow trying to impede his investigation? It's an excellent question. Uh, instead, he simply took some notes and shared them with a few people. But if he really thought that uh, Trump had engaged in obstruction of justice, I think he had a duty to come forward and report that to higher officials in the Justice Department and certainly go public with it. He didn't do that, which suggests to me that he didn't think what Trump Trump did really amounted to obstruction of justice, right? Remember this, Chris, about obstruction of justice. There has to be, it has to be a, a, an impeding an investigation in a corrupt way, which is to say for political reasons or some other illegitimate reason. To ask an FBI director is, uh, from what we know of the meeting, that if it's, you know, if, if he can't, see, if he could see his way clear to letting uh, the investigation go since this is about Mike Flynn, Flynn had just been fired. Uh, I, my guess is that Comey looked at that and took, took the view that it was he was being asked that if he could do it, if he could see it. And his view was he couldn't see his way clear to do that. He didn't do it. And then you later had testimony from him and also from his deputy that said there'd been no real effort, no effort to impede the investigation. So I suspect that, as Jason says, Comey did not think he was there, there was obstruction of justice involved here. Or he would have said so. And this is a guy who's proved more than once that he's always ready to threaten to quit. He does that all the time. And by the way, your the, the viewer's question said, did he threaten Comey? He didn't threaten Comey that we know of. Juan? Well, I think if Comey had come forward and done that at that moment, it would have been grandstanding and it would have impeded the ongoing investigation. So I don't think even if he saw it as constituting obstruction of justice, it would have been appropriate. What was appropriate was to make it part of the investigation and see where it went from there. I, I think, though, that, you know, at this point, there's so much fear in the White House of what is coming. They have now formed their own group to try to get ahead of this curve. But this remains a dark cloud over the president. You know, Brett, the, there's a, the legal issue as to whether it's obstruction of justice. There's also the political issue. You and I ha have covered a lot of these big hearings where all of Washington and a lot of the country stops and waits to see the, the, the key witness raise his hand and take the oath. How potentially politically damaging, maybe not legally, uh, not a, ca uh, a case for a prosecution, but how politically damaging could this potentially be? It could be damaging, if, but I, I don't think Juan's explanation holds up very well, and I don't think Comey's in any position to come in and say, yeah, he tried to obstruct justice and I kept quiet about it. I don't think that, that won't work in my view. And the other factor we have to keep in no, mind... But if he just says what he supposedly wrote in this memo, that's it's not damaging. Not, yeah, but, not, it's, not, but, that's, but, that's already, case, but, but that's already out there. Whatever damage has been done on that is, it might be reinforced for a couple of days, but that doesn't really change the, change the atmosphere or move the ball very much. And remember this, Chris, he will be under the same strictures as he was when he was in office about discussions of an ongoing investigation. He really can't do that much, which, which is why I think this hearing, like so many others before it, will probably not quite live up to its well, billing, although the coverage is going to be unbelievable. Right. And one of the important things to keep in mind is that the amount of damage that this hearing creates is tied to how the president responds. The president is going to be watching this hearing like everybody else and we've seen that he has an inability to 
prevent himself from reacting. So if he is tweeting in real time, right. if he is giving interviews yeah. after where he's weighing you in. You hope and, he does that, don't you? Uh, you know, as a journalist, we always <laughs> like, like to like hear that, we always like to hear from the president. But <laughs> but some of the damage will be within his control. Jason. That's the damage. Um, Sean Spicer, White House press spokesman, came out, said we wanted to talk about infrastructure this week. How much are we going to be talking about infrastructure with this uh, hearing going on this week? That's the political damage. It keeps this in the news, and instead of being focused on advancing a, an agenda on whether it's infrastructure or health care reform or tax reform, we're talking about the drip, drip, drip from this investigation. You know, it wouldn't, this wouldn't, ex Bob Mueller would not be a special counsel in this deal if we didn't have word of just this kind of interaction between Comey and the president and the pressure on Jeff Sessions. I don't think we have any way of knowing if that's true. I think that's Remember, Number one, this no. is primarily and has always been and has always been described as a counterintelligence investigation Correct. to get to the bottom of what the Russians tried to do to hack the election. And of course, as a part of that, but just a part, was the question of whether there had been collusion between the, between the Trump campaign and the Russians. So that's a piece of it, but it's not the main thrust of it necessarily. But it is, and it has it tremendous political damage, tremendous collateral damage for the president. And the reason we're discussing obstruction of justice and whether or not it would have been in appropriate for Jim Comey to come forward at that moment is because this investigation continues. In fact, it's escalated, Britt. I would agree with that entirely, which, tell, which is another reason why I have said and will say again that this case has traveled farther on less evidence, I'm talking about the collusion piece of it, than any scandal I think I've ever seen. All right, but you well, know a, that, in fact, the what, intelligence yeah, agencies what, have said Russia definitely interfered in this Okay, what's election. the underlying crime? The what's underlying the crime? crime, potentially, and that's why I disagree with you, would be obstruction of justice been, by the President of the United there's States. There's been one crime identified, and Mike Flynn was the victim of the of the leaking of his unmasked name. That's the that you think that's the that's crime. That's the only crime oh, that's see. been so and far Mike identified. And Flynn meeting with the that's Russian ambassador to try to undercut the Obama sanctions. That doesn't bother that's you. Not Come a, on. That's not a crime. Oh, okay. All right. In any case, you know, this is kind of a, a Fox News Sunday panel classic. Juan and Rick going back <laughs> at it again. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, President Trump is, made a new push last night for his travel ban in a tweet while the attack in London was still unfolding. Uh, he's taking the case to the Supreme Court. Here's what Vice President Pence had to say this week. The ability to come into the United States of America is a privilege, not a right. Jason, does this latest attack add new impetus to the president's call for a travel ban? I, I don't think it does. Um, he clearly does. I mean, he was linking it in, in his tweets, um, but the United Kingdom is not part of the, the list of countries that would be subjected to the ban, A. And, and B, again, as, as, as previous guests uh, earlier said, Senator Blunt, I believe, uh, mostly there's a homegrown folks that uh, Manchester bomber was someone who had been born and raised in Manchester and so on. And here domestically, a lot of you talk to the Homeland Security officials, that's what they're worried about, people already here being radicalized. And then you see the timeline that the administration laid out for this temporary ban. They wanted several months. They've had several months. So no, I don't, I don't think. What, what, what struck me about this, though, is, is Trump, again, tweeting and, 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 and talking about this publicly. And that has been a problem in these court cases that have come up so far. The judges have been throwing his words back at him, saying they speak to a state of mind here. And I think that, again, he, he has to be more disciplined in how he talks about Julie, this issue. Julie, I'm going to pick up on that because the whole ban which was which was put out the original ban on january 27th one week in talked about 90 day delay 120 day delay while they put together an extreme vetting plan we're now 130 days into this administration why didn't they put to together the extreme vetting plan so they don't have to worry about a ban. It's a great question. That extreme vetting plan is essentially nowhere. And what we were told at the end of that first week is that the rushed rollout of the original ban was because the threat was so urgent. And certainly, I think that argument has been undermined by the fact that there hasn't been a major attack in the U.S. during that period and that the administration has not moved quickly on the extreme vetting. And just to Jason's point there, and it ties back into what we were talking about with Comey, the White House has been focused on this idea that this is not a travel ban. They don't want to use this language. And then the president last night puts that language back out on the table. Panel, thank you. See you next week. And we'll be right back with a final word. Pain relievers might all seem the same. 
But Salon Pos Pain Relief Patch is the first and only FDA-approved OTC topical inset and the strongest labeled pain reliever available without a prescription. Salon Pos for tough pain. When you grow.